enough chatter. Here it is, my most likable song ever. Coca-Cola, lipstick ring, go dance all night, dance all night. I've got dancing legs, woo! I've got dancing legs! They won't stop me dancing, no, they won't stop me dancing. Kiss me, just kiss me, kiss me, Nefertiti. Just the way you like it, just the way you like it. Kiss me, kiss me, lipstick, kiss me, lipstick ring, oh, that's the way you like it. I think of all the directors working in Ireland today, Lenny Abramson has been the most consequential of the lot, and I don't think it's embellishment to say his filmography has shaped the very face of contemporary Irish cinema. With no shortage of critical acclaim and commercial success, some films of his have become household names across Ireland, while also gathering plenty of attention on the international stage. But what is Lenny Abramson doing different than the rest of his peers, and how easily can you identify those differences within his work? Well, you're hardly going to find it staring into the fridge. First up, and crucial to mention when dissecting a distinct style from his films, is a signature feature that's at work before the script has even been written, and that's the source for his storytelling. Some filmmakers prefer to work in an auteur style space, controlling the creative direction of a project from the beginning till the end, making the work as much an exercise in screenwriting as it is directing. But Abrahamson doesn't do this. Instead, looking back at his work, there's one pretty striking consistency in his inspiration, and that's working as a direct adaptation with several films having concrete origins in other literature. In the case of 2016's Room, the film is adapted from a novel of the same name by Irish-Canadian writer Emma Donoghue, or in Frank from 2014, where the title character's origins is in a newspaper article by Welsh journalist John Ronson. Sorry. Frank. That's amazing. <laughs> Flattered grin, followed by a bashful half-smile. No, y people should know about you. You should be famous. You understand. Moving on, Abrahamson's distinct vision can really be seen in the types of stories he likes to tell too. More than any other filmmaker, I think Abrahamson's tendency to put character at the heart of a story really goes a long way in broadcasting his method as a director. One thing that sticks out right away is his fondness for dealing with characters who are isolated in some form. While their main characters in Room, Joy and Jack, are extreme examples, where for the first half of the film they're literally isolated from the world stuck inside their tiny room with only a skylight window connecting them to the outside world. But I think the characters of Adam and Paul represent a far more nuanced take on this social isolation. Facing rejection from anyone that knows them and prejudice from anyone that doesn't, you really get the sense that the two are truly alone in their world. Take yourself, I, I, you junkie, help us, and fuck up! And while they always have each other, Margot Halloran's script, coupled with Abrahamson's direction, has their identities within the story almost fused together, with the audience never really clued in as to who's who. The pair simply exist as... Adam and Paul, man over. His 2007 film, Garage, is another strong case of this isolation and loneliness really driving the story. While our main character, Josie, is literally alone in a huge number of shots, it's the little details that really indicate to us how truly lonely he is. No. Will we go out? We will. Come on, Josie. Loneliness, I think, is very, uh, you know, undramatic loneliness is something I'm really interested in. Like, how does a person sustain their sense of self-worth or the value of their life in isolation? How do you make sense of the, of the small actions that are called for in daily life, like keeping yourself clean, fed, housed, going about your daily business, dealing with the state, you know, in terms of like paperwork and all that. If it's entirely supported by your own, there's nothing else, nobody outside you to support that project of your life. I, I find that does raise the most fundamental questions about what it is to kind of want to continue to live. And um, So loneliness is something I thought about and, and I've actually thought about it since I was a kid. Funny, I, th I, I you know, I always, always, very um, drawn to look at people who were alone and wonder what that was like. The camera work is a big player here too. These establishing shots picturing Josie in about as small a space as possible compared to his environment. Or here, as Josie's ridiculed by Breffney in the pub, Abrahamson frames everybody else at the bar together. Josie was giving us his five-year plan. Fuck's sake. Why don't you, Josie? Well, Josie, 
is framed totally alone. What? We're opening later both the weekends, just Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. Mental health is another big thematic consistency in his work, but I think the fascinating aspect to Abrahamson's approach is his diversity in broadcasting these deeply personal issues with the audience. Like in real life, to find potential problems with somebody's mental state, sometimes you have to dig beneath the surface a little. It's not always a case of... Sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper. I think in Garage, we get plenty of indicators for Josie's internal struggles. While he's clearly a deeply lonely individual, he's also incapable of truly connecting with someone. This scene with Mr. Scared is probably my favorite example. It starts out pretty straightforward. Two men chatting about fishing. Just out be the water there. Walking or dropping a line. Fishing, yeah. Pike, owl pike. Or eels. Aye. But when Mr. Skerritt really opens up to Josie, clearly struggling with the loss of his son. You think it's going to stop? It never stops. He doesn't know how to respond, so he just doesn't. He just continues to make small talk. There's some building in town, isn't there? What the hell with the town, Josie? No such things as towns anymore. And I think this is what really sets Abrahamson apart. Filmmakers have been criticised for using dialogue for exposition for decades. But here, the exposition of character is coming from what's not being said. And you're a great man to listen to me. Thanks. You were good to me in your time. Hi, Niels. Set in rural Ireland, I think there's plenty of criticism going on here regarding the Irish culture surrounding mental health. There, it's a culture of hiding struggle where, regardless of how bad things are on the inside, on the outside, it's always... Good enough. Good enough. I think his approach to broadcasting a character's mental state is probably at its most formalist here in Adam and Paul. Throughout the film, the colour palette has matched the two hopeless heroin addicts' prospects pretty effectively. It's been, without question, incredibly bleak. What money have you? I don't know. Odds and coppers. But when the two finally score, the visual style of the film shifts completely, and we enter this almost dreamlike state. The overexposed frames, the use of slow motion, and Stephen Rennick's almost mystical score. Under this guise, even the towering flats in Ballymun, with their translucent lights, almost look tranquil in the background. Mental health is an idea, I suppose that becomes the kind of um, descriptive phrase when things get really bad and so given that film or at least the films I've been interested in making want to look at how people are where the fault lines and fracture lines inside people are the best way to see that is to put them on uh, put pressure on them and then see how those fractures begin to open so yeah I think that's 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 a good way of that's a good principle in in storytelling which aims to have psychological depth right but also i suppose personally i am interested in how people hang on or don't in life and i'm drawn to characters who are who whose grip on on a, on a viable life is tenuous will people know i've been arrested michael i have been arrested josie you're just making a statement what would people know like i don't know it's a small town right I think these pressures and the influence they have are ultimately the biggest catalyst for changing characters in his films, sometimes becoming more exaggerated versions of their previous self. Let's take the fucking head off. I have a certificate. Or being fundamentally changed by the process. I know I ruined everything. I'm sorry. I think another stylistic choice that makes his films uniquely distinguished are the kind of relationships he dedicates time to. One that appears a lot is the parent-child dynamic. Sometimes highlighting the relationship is pretty direct, like here in What Richard Did. Regardless of how we feel about Richard, what he's done, and how it's played out in the past, 
I think the real tragedy he's trying to broadcast here is the almost grief on his father's face when he realizes that he's essentially lost his son. Dad, I did it. It was me. I kicked him in the head and I killed him. No. 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 I'm so sorry, Dad. I'm so sorry. But sometimes the relationship is a bit more figurative or symbolic. This scene from Adam and Paul, this is probably the only time the two have shared a positive interaction with another person. You don't be so fucking hard. How can I be done with them? Practically brought up with us. I match you. The same as they are now. <laughs> but I think Room takes this even further. With a character like Joy, we have someone who's not really certain where they stand on this sort of dynamic. On the one hand, she's really the only parent figure Jack has, but because she never got a chance to grow up herself, I think some of the biggest conflicts in these relationships is a direct consequence to Joy's position in this parent-child dynamic. I just want him to connect with something. Joy. Joy. He's really doing fine. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm supposed to be happy. You just need to rest, okay? No, I don't. I don't need that's, to rest. That's what the doctor that is said. not what the doctor said. You don't know what he said because it was a confidential conversation and you don't know what he said. All right, all right. All right. You're impossible to talk to right now. Well, sorry. Well, no, no, you're not sorry. Yeah, I'm not sorry. You have no idea what's going on in my head. Yeah, well, try me. I have asked you. And then what? Then every time you look at me, that's all that you see? When I look at you, Joy, I will see my daughter. You don't need me. You've been doing just fine without me. Look, maybe regardless of all these overarching concepts, like a distinct visual style or some thematic consistencies, I think the films of Lenny Abramson ultimately speak to people and allow for at least some sort of connection between viewer and filmmaker. And whether that connection was made by something mentioned in this video or something more personal that every viewer brings to the film.